Dr. Edmund Locard formulated the basic exchange principle of forensic science as every contact leaves a trace. Later, criminologist Paul L. Kirk expressed this principle as follows. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool marks he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood he deposits or collects. All of these and more bear mute witness against him. This is evidence that does not forget. It is not confused by the excitement of the moment. It is not absent because human witnesses are. It is factual evidence. Physical evidence cannot be wrong. It cannot perjure itself. It cannot be wholly absent. Only human failure to find it, study it, and understand it can diminish its value. Team Library Summer Program and this is the Forensic Science section and we have a lot of interesting things for you to do this summer. Um, everything that we're doing there is a PDF on the um, library web pages that you can download. If you have a printer you can print some of the stuff out. If you don't it's fine just read it along on your phone or your computer. Um, we're hoping that you will message the library and tell us about your experiments, upload pictures, We'd like to hear from you. If you ask questions, we'll answer. And at the end, we're all going to try to solve a mystery together. So stay tuned to this place. Yes. The first thing we're gonna do is base, is looking at trace evidence. Trace evidence is very, very small pieces of evidence that you are likely going to need a microscope to analyze. Uh, it's also comparison evidence. Comparison is when you say, does the, could this hair have come from this person? You can't use trace evidence for identification. It's comparison. We can say, yes, this hair could have come from that person. It's also very good for illumination. We can say, no, there is no way this hair came from that person. So good for illumination, good for, uh, it could have come from this person and it adds weight to other, other evidence. So if you have fibers and you have hair and you have soil, all of that together builds a strong case where any one piece is not enough. So what we're going, and I didn't explain what low card is. Low card is for every interaction, you leave a trace. So if I enter a room, I leave something of myself uh, in that room when I leave. And when I leave, I take something of that room with me. So if I didn't have gloves on and touch the wall, I could be leaving fingerprints. If I walked across this rug, I could be scuffing off dirt from the soles of my shoes onto this rug, and at the same time, I'm picking up fibers from the rug. And if you see these brightly colored fibers on my shoes, you'd say there's a strong chance that she was in that room. So what you'll need today is you're going to need socks. Any color of sock is fine. Um, uh, what we're going to do is you're going to walk around a room and see what your socks pick up. Uh, you need some envelopes because we're also going to go through that room and we're going to try to find bits of trace evidence in that room. Tweezers are nice. Uh, if you don't have tweezers, you can pick things up with your fingers. 
Uh, you can try to scrape them onto a piece of paper. In real life, we would be trying not to touch the evidence because remember, every contact leaves a trace. So if I would try to pick up something with my bare fingers, I would be leaving a trace of myself on that evidence and that makes it contaminated. Um, tape is a good thing. And if you have a black light that you can, uh, that is a good thing, but you don't have to have it for this. And of course you want a notebook and a pen. Your notebook doesn't, can be just a spiral bound. It can be a, um, a, any kind of a notebook. You can just take a handful of papers and staple them together. Uh, you're gonna to be taking notes for every one of these exercises and you might wanna keep them. So what we're going to do is we're gonna select a room and search through it and see if we can find little tiny bits of trace evidence. Um, what I'd also like you to do is once you've selected your room, put the socks on and walk around the room in your stocking feet. So the things we're kind of looking for is, and don't do this right after somebody swept the floor, that, that will get rid of a lot of our trace evidence, but go through the room, examine the floor. If you've got a pet, you're gonna find pet hairs. Look and see if you see little pieces of plant material, little pieces of dirt. Uh, look on the couch, see what you can see on the couch. Um, write down what you find and where you find it. Um, what I wanna show you is just using this rug for example, because rugs are very rich forms of, um, yeah, tweezers, very rich sources of trace evidence. So I have my envelope and I'm going to say this rug was in the hallway. So I write hallway down and I'm going to start seeing what I can see on this rug. And I can see a little piece of white stuff right here. Some little white crumb that I can pick up and put in my envelope. And make sure that it goes in the envelope. And I can pick up a little piece here and I see a little white thread there. Um, if I get fibers of the rug, that's fine because if I, that will, I know these came from the rug. If you're doing it on a floor or you're, uh, any hard surface, this is what you would try to do. You try to pick up your pieces. But since a rug is a soft surface, what we can try to do is taping it. And I'm going to take these gloves off just for the purpose of using the tape. And hopefully I can find an end here. Okay. So I have scissors and I'll cut out this ratty end. <laughs> You're not going to let it go down again. Bit of the tape and I'm going to have a piece of paper to stick my tape on. So all I do is I take the tape and I stick it to the carpet and pull it up. And I can do that more than one place on the carpet because I'm going to call this the carpet tape. And then I will want to take and just stick it to a piece of paper. And then of course I will document that this piece of tape came from the hallway rug. So you've collected all your evidence, you've put it in an envelope, And then take off your sock and put it in a baggie and label it. So these I have ready. I actually went through my kitchen. So I have an envelope that's laid, labeled kitchen, EAG for Elizabeth Ann Gardner and 2020. And here is the left sock. Okay. So this is what's in the kitchen. This is our transfer. 
as I was walking through the kitchen, what transferred into my sock. So, what we're going to do is and the back of the envelope I sealed across the flap of the envelope so I know if somebody's opened it or not. So this is my evidence that I collected and now I'm back in the lab and I'm going to analyze it. So I dump out everything that was in there. See if I can find my tweezers. All right, what did I find on the floor of my kitchen? This is kind of bad, isn't it? There's a lot of hair in there. So there's some brown hairs. Right here is a white hair. If you have light colored evidence, if you can have some dark paper to lay it down on, I was actually going to, this is one option, it was some dark paper from a brown paper bag that you could obviously use. But, now see if I can get that white hair. I wonder where white hair came from in my kitchen, right? But it's the dark hairs that are curious. So I'm going to sort out, here is a piece of plastic. Would you normally, um, would you wear gloves even in this part? I would definitely be wearing gloves. So there's still, there's, there's a possibility of contamination if you don't wear gloves doing this part. Right, I should, we would, I should be wearing gloves, yes. Here is a purple fiber. Here is a blue fiber. Here is another purple fiber. Here is, there's little pieces of orange plastic. Here is a piece of gray plastic. Some more hairs, long hairs are definitely, long hairs are probably from a person. We don't know for sure. We'd have to do more tests, look at it under a microscope to make sure it is a hair from a person. That one, that one is actually a short white hair as opposed to a long white hair. Here, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna use my fingers to, so this goes a little easier. More fibers. Where did my blue fibers go? Maybe I didn't sort any out yet. Blue fibers, blue fibers, purple fiber. I'm going to get a pencil because there's hairs with the fibers. There's just hairs everywhere. But there are quite a few short white and dark hairs. So where do you think short white and dark hairs might come from? There must be a pet. There must be a pet in the household, you would think, right? I'm sorting out a bunch of small pieces of plant material. What I looks like I have a little bit of food crumbs right here. Looks like I have a couple of seeds. And here is, goes flying. Here is, could it be a seed? Is it a bean? More fibers. I have a purple one and a blue one. More plant material. Looks like it might be part of a leaf, a slightly different. So, oh, and here is a little white paint chip. So all of these things I found in my kitchen. Oh no, you're gonna think it's terrible. I've got all these hairs in my kitchen. All right. So, what I wanna do, what you wanna do when you've done this and sorted out so here is plastic, gray, plastic, orange. There's one, one gray hair. There is animal hair. So what we've done here, and take a picture of it, 
So you have a record and what we've done is we've, this is what you would find in the kitchen. Now, some of this may, we might want to save. We might want to save our purple fibers because so I'm going to put my purple fibers, I've separated them out. And this is a little four inch square of paper. I got this from a regular sheet of printer paper. And I'm going to fold it on the diagonal. And then I'm going to fold the corners in one third. And you can see it's starting to look like an envelope. It's a, and then I'm going to fold it so that I have a rectangle with a flap. And then I'm going to stick the flap down into one of the creases. And there I have an evidence fold. There is in the PDF for this exercise, there the last page shows you exactly how to make your evidence folds. I will say purple fibers. I will initial it EAG and I will put today's date. So now I can put this back in my envelope and it's sorted and I don't have to worry about it getting mixed up with other things. And you would do that for each of these pieces. What you would like for this is a comb or some small card like a gift card. And we'll see, can we... We are going to look and see what we can find on our sock. And just opening up, I'm getting a little few pieces falling off of it. And I can take my tweezers and let's use this paper since it's clean. And I can put light hairs on my sock. it here. Here is a blue fiber. Here is a light colored hair. A lot of small dog hairs. So you can pick things off. Another thing you can do is you can take your comb and try and you would do this with a large object and if you're using a comb, make sure you get permission. Don't use your brother's comb that he uses to comb his hair. And the comb, his comb needs to be clean, I would guess. The comb needs to be clean, and I want to sort out my blue fiber. Another thing I can use is a gift card, and I can scrape this off. You wouldn't want to shake it too much for fear that your evidence might fly everywhere. So, what did I find on my sock? I'm finding some of the plant material. Similar to the leaf we found. I'm definitely finding animal hairs. But I also found a blue fiber. So I have a blue fiber. I have plant material. have some white hairs and I have quite a few animal hairs. So what we would like you to do is select your room, find your trace evidence, and see if you wear, wear socks and walk through that same room and, and walk, keep the socks on for 15 minutes to a half an hour to make sure you have some transfer 
and see if you can find evidence from the room on your sock. Take pictures, upload them on uh, Facebook Messenger, and we would love to hear from your results in this experiment. Okay, so one of the experiments we're going to be doing this summer is a soil comparison. You might not, um, you might never have heard that soil can be a useful bit of evidence at a crime scene if there's mud on a sneaker did that mud come from the place where the sneaker was found or did the mud come from someplace else? It can be used to connect a person to a crime. So for this um, exercise, what you're going to want to have are three plastic bags. Um, Ziploc baggie is really great, but anything that you have that holds about at least two cups of soil. Um, we want to have three spoons. We want to have a marker, and if I grabbed a marker, that would be a good thing. We want to have a marker. Uh, we want to have some aluminum foil, or if you have cookie sheets that your parents will let you use, or any kind of a surface that you can spread your soil out on, and you want your notebook and your pen. So what we're going to do for this experiment is take a walk and scout out three different places that you think might be good to collect soil from. Uh, good ideas are a garden. A garden would have soil that's rich in organic material. Uh, your backyard is a place to collect soil. Um, local park might be a place. If you collect soil from anybody's property, make sure you have their permission. So what I've done is I've got my three soil samples. I've got one from Rhodes Park, I've got one in Rushton Park in, in Birmingham, and I've got one from my backyard. Um, once you've collected your soil, you want to bring it home and you're going to want to let it dry out. Now I've already dried mine, but I'm going to spread them out on some aluminum foil. And you can see my bags were labeled so I remember where they come from. And I'm going to keep my bag with my soil so I don't get them mixed up because you would be surprised how quickly you get things mixed up when you're working with several different samples. So you can see how a cookie sheet would be really great for this but foil works just fine. This is my backyard. I've got some aluminum pie pans. How about that? Aluminum pie pans would be really good. Or if you have any, um, if you have any aluminum dishes that had food in them, like uh, something that comes from a takeout order that you had and it comes in an aluminum pan would be good. Uh, you don't want to use plastic, well if you're just going to dry them you could use a plastic pan, but if you have your parents' permission, you can also dry your soil in the oven at the lowest oven temperature. But of course, you'd want your parents' permission for that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at our soil and describe it. What does it look like? What are the characteristics of the soil from Rushton Park and, and Rhodes Park and my backyard? So this one is, turn it right side up so I can read it. This one is Rushton. And I've got some tweezers here which are nice to use but you don't have to have them. And I'm gonna kind of look at my dirt. And if you look at these three of the, the Rushton is sort of a medium brown. And one thing I notice is there's little red pebbles in it. And you can use your fingers with this. There's nothing toxic. 
a forensic scientist would of course not use their fingers and I am not getting any of here's one of the little red the little red pebbles that I'm seeing in this. So this kind of looks something that like might be in the gravel in a walk. Um, there's a few pebbles. Then the backyard dirt, you can see that this is the lightest. This is almost a tan. So the backyard. So I should record all this. This has red pebbles. And I see a few pieces of bark, but not a lot of organic material, so some organic. Um, and when I say organic, what I mean is plant material, pieces of wood that might be in there. The backyard dirt is sort of a tan color. It's not a dark or medium brown. It has quite a few pebbles in it. And you see very little organic material. Here's a little piece of what might be a root or something, but very little organic. Would insects or things like that that you would find in the soil, would that mean anything or? Um, I would definitely write down that there were insects. Um, mostly I would think that it has a lot of organic material that that means it would be supporting plants and, and insect life, which takes us to the Rhodes Park. So the Rhodes Park is the darkest brown. And you can see that there is a lot of plant material in this. It's a very fine soil. So here's some pine needles, a lot of pieces that look like roots. So this has the most organic. It's a dark brown and it's a very fine soil. So you write these down and that's a physical description. What does it look like? What are the similarities and the differences? What we're going to do next is look at the composition. What we're going to do is suspend it in water and then watch it as it settles. And we'll see if it forms layers and we'll see if there's organic material that floats in the top um, so, what you want to do is write, use your marker and write the name of each one because again, we don't want to get them mixed up. So I'll start with the Rushton and I'll try to do this without making a super mess, but we're going to try to fill the cup a little less than halfway full. can see some nice layers. And it looked like I had a lot of dirt in there, didn't it? But you can see it, it's not filling up the, the cup all that quickly. So that looks good. Okay. Actually, I probably went a little over. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill it um, within an inch of the top with water. And we dried it beforehand so that we could just really see all of the parts of it. You dry it beforehand so that you have a constant condition to look at color. So um, if these were wet, this one might look just as dark as this one. And you can kind of see that happening now. This is turning very dark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stir it up nicely. Get as much of it as suspended as I can. to put it down here and we're going to let this one settle and go on to our next one. Oops, don't want a bag, I want a cup. So this is the backyard dirt.
Let's see, maybe I can try scooping it. Be a little more efficient. Notice this one has a lot of pebbles in it, and I don't really want the pebbles in my sample um, because they don't tell us a lot about the composition of the dirt. We're looking at, um, is there a lot of sand in it? Is there a lot of plant material such as that? of the top. I give myself enough room that I can stir it without spilling it all over the place. I think you mean by the colors being very close to each other when they're wet. Yes. They're between very close in color. Yes. Things look different when they're wet than when they're dry. And my last one, this one is Rhodes Park. the organic material in this. I kept the spoon separate so that I'm not cross-contaminating my samples. Got a small layer, the stuff floating on the top. I do. Of, yeah, the stuff. So all of the lighter weight things, the organic things sort of float to the top. All the organic things float to the top. Um, and the soil has settled, and we have a layer at the bottom, and here that's the same material with a little bit of dark in it, and there's a very thin layer of a slightly darker brown soil. Um, this hasn't had as much time. This one has had far less time. So what you want to do is you're gonna take some time with this. Uh, in five minutes, check it and look at it and record what you see in the layers. And then 10 minutes, then maybe half hour. And then if you can, let it sit for two or three hours. Take some pictures of this. Take some pictures of your soil. Take some pictures of your sedimentation. Um, and messenger them to the Avondale Library because we'd like to see what you're doing this summer and we'll post your pictures and we will use soil analysis as part of the way of solving our crime. <laughs>